Um, Michael's a great guy. He lives here in Provo with his wife, Cynthia, and four boys. And we look, ask you to well, give him a round welcome. <laughs> Good afternoon. I always get a little nervous when people clap and I haven't said anything yet. So hopefully uh, you might clap at the end, but thanks for the warm welcome. Um, I certainly appreciate being back on campus at BYU and uh, being here at the Kennedy Center. I spent a lot of time in the seats that you're in listening to a lot of different lectures. And I, I think we've got uh, a fairly um, somewhat of a diverse group here. How many of you are from political science, just by a show of hands? How many of you are from the Kennedy Center, International Relations? Okay, any from business school? Okay, so we have sort of a, a mix here. Anyone outside, any outliers outside of those three areas? <clears throat> oh good, okay, PR, uh, great. Economics. Economics, okay, and econ, okay, great. I also have a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Justin Callup. Justin, if you could stand. Justin's um, in our international department of Franklin Covey. And what's been great, Justin got his, his PhD here at uh, BYU in, in industrial organizational psychology. And um, it's been interesting. We've kind of crossed paths and worked together. He's been at Worthland Research and has done some outsourcing and worked at Accenture and consulting. And so <coughs> as I was telling him about this workshop, I said, why don't you come down because there's always great talent here and people looking for internships. And Justin, we've, we've actually hired a couple folks uh, from the Kennedy Center uh, to come and, and work at uh, Franklin Covey. And I think, is Logan, Logan here? Okay, there's Logan. So Logan's been uh, doing an internship recently and, and you can talk to him about the experience. But if any of you are interested in exploring internship opportunities at our firm, uh, you can certainly talk to Justin, get his card, or you can talk to me or both of us. Um, as we're always looking for great talent from BYU. And we know that whenever we get students from BYU and through the Kennedy School and, and here, they're, they're always top notch. I mean, just to kind of get in here, you really differentiate yourself. And so it's, a, it's really a privilege for us to get good talent um, on campus here. So I'm gonna talk for about maybe 40, 45 minutes. And I, I've got a hard stop that I'll do at 4.45. So wherever we are in the fun, uh, along this path. I'm going to stop and then we'll just do some Q&A. <coughs> I invite you to take some notes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I, I'll just go through a series of slides and content. Um, certainly if you, if you have a burning question or want to talk, feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm going to move through some content and some ideas. But my intent is this, that I can stimulate some thinking from your perspective. And if you sort of come in here with a toolbox, Hopefully I can put some tools in that toolbox that will get you to think about your career and some of your personal and professional goals in uh, sort of a, a more informed and a, and a helpful way. Because I know where you're sitting, um, some of you academics may be the end game. You want to go on and get your master's or your PhD and you want to teach or you want to chair a department, et cetera. And, and others of you will go out into uh, for, you know, foreign services, government, state, local, federal, and many of you will go into business. Uh, my specific niche is gonna be primarily in business, um, and I'll, I'll kind of share that context. So hopefully you can get some, some thoughts and some ideas from this presentation today that will help you on your path towards your career in business. Um, as was mentioned, <coughs> let's talk first about where we're going. Now, um, I had a little bit of guidance, um, just kind of on some best practices and things that have uh, been in this lecture series in the past. I've spoken in this lecture series in the past, but I'll follow this format here, and it's primarily about what are my work responsibilities, some of the clients I've worked with, and sort of what do I do as a practitioner and in business and consulting. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my career path, what I call key uh, touch points. What were some key touch points along the way that kind of, I think, helped differentiate and provide some uh, direction and guidance for my career? Um, how I did what I did. And then I'll talk about some lessons learned. What are some best practices? What are some lessons? So if you're sitting there and thinking about what are some lessons you can learn from an old guy like me, um, hopefully I'll share a couple key insights and ideas that might help you along from a, uh, you know, as you go out into the job market. And then 
Um, I've got this last piece here is practical career recommendations. What are some recommendations for you to consider from a personal and professional perspective? Okay. Now, if we have time, I've got some tools to talk about visioning for your future career and setting goals. But because of the limited time, we may or may not get there. But I've at least got that as an agenda item, and we'll see if we can, we can cover that. Now, I don't know if I can put my slides out on a, if we have a, a SharePoint site or, or we can send it out. So we can certainly make these slides available as well. And then we'll spend some time for Q&A, and I'll take on some of your tough uh, questions that you have at the end. <coughs> uh, Franklin Covey. When you hear Franklin Covey, what comes to mind? Have any of you been through any Franklin Covey training or read any of the books or content? What do you, th what do you think ever what it, when you hear Franklin Covey? What, what comes to mind? Yes, yeah, Seven Habits, pretty, str pretty strong brand. We, we just had our 25th anniversary and relaunch of our content. It sold... Uh, 20, 25 million copies, one of the all-time best-selling books. If you haven't read Seven Habits, put it on your bucket list of must-reads. It's a classic. What else? Anything else? Yes? Day planners. Time management. How many of you still carry around a day planner? Okay, a few of you do. Some of you have it in your, your handheld. We actually divested about, f about three and a half, four years ago our time management business. It was a cash cow. That's what, how we made money. So we had Franklin Quest in Salt Lake, Covey Leadership Center in Provo. The two merged it back in 1996. And it was taking off like this. And then over time, technology, they had some disruptors and some things in with, with handhelds and other things where the planner business started to die. So we divested that and got out of that business, which was our core business, uh, you know, four years ago. <clears throat> so we, they still have our brand. And we still own 20% of the, that business. But uh, many of us know, are known as the time management company. So you had the world's largest time management, world's largest, one of the world's largest leadership development merged to become Franklin Quest or Franklin Covey. And then uh, right now we're primarily focused on leadership around team and organizational development. Um, we're obviously across the planet. Any of these dark areas is where we uh, have uh, international offices or licensees. We have uh, approximately 1,800 plus employees. We're in 145 countries with both direct offices that we own and international uh, licensee offices. And, and Justin certainly has um, a lot of great insight as he sort of heads up um, business development uh, in that area as, as one of our um, senior consultants. And then we, we operate in about 35 languages. And then on the bottom there is our mission. Our mission is that we want to enable greatness in people and organizations everywhere. Now, we don't have greatness and say we have greatness and we want to give it to you. What we suggest is that greatness exists within every human soul. So whether we're teaching Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist Chinese or uh, Christian or atheist or whatever, we would suggest that greatness exists within everyone. So our job is to give people principles and tools that can help them be successful wherever, in it, whatever walk of life they're in. And so that's kind of our mission, is that we really want to enable the greatness that exists within people. And then we provide the, the timeless principles and the timeless tools that people can use to improve their performance. Now, I, I put this up. You may have either are familiar with some of those brands or, or like some of those brands. But these are clients, um, as I was sort of, I, I was in New York City this week um, working with an Indian company called Genpak. Uh, they have about 7,000 employees in India, and then they're headquartered in New York. They do business process outsourcing and IT outsourcing. That's kind of a hot topic of outsourcing. We're moving jobs over to other countries, and you get a lot of politicians that stand up and say, don't do that. We're losing all these jobs. Well, the problem is the, the, the discussion's pretty much over. <laughs> They've been outsourcing for many, many years, and that, it's not going away. It's actually creating uh, more competition, better cost efficiencies, and driving innovation globally. And we are moving to more of this, you know, less local, more global. Uh, less um, sort of, you know, top-down, uh, horizontal organizations, more flat, more vertical, more virtual type organizations. Um, you know, and we're getting more global in nature. Uh, matter of fact, I was at GE uh, Imagineering, or GE Imagination, 
Um, I was with their uh, vice chairman last week in Houston, Texas. So we had the vice chairman of GE talking, and then we had the, the U.S. ambassador to China. He was next, and then I had the afternoon. I mean, how would you like to follow those two individuals? <laughs> Not so easy. But at GE, they're basically saying, look, we're in 170 countries, and we've got 300,000 employees, and we have got to get rid of bureaucracy. We've got to be faster. We've got to be smarter. We've got to be more lean. And so they're looking at new structures and new models of work. And what they're saying is, is that, the, that the American dollar is not the world currency. You know what the world currency is? World currency is jobs. And so as they compete or they promote, and they're into the 170 um, you know, countries, the way that they differentiate themselves, they, they partner up with governments, and they say the way that we can add value in your government, whether you're in Ulaanbaatar or whether you're in Kazakhstan or whether you're in Pakistan or wherever you are, we can come in and we can deliver jobs. And so the new world of work, it becomes borderless. It's almost timeless. It's, it's you know, seven days a week, 24-7. And it's better, faster, cheaper. And so this idea about how do we leverage networks and platforms and technology to really drive this whole virtual world of work. And these companies that we work with are always asking the question, how can you help, not on the technical side, but how do you help build our leaders and our teams and our organizations and our culture? And so when I was working with GE two weeks ago, <coughs> I was there um, teaching some curriculum on what we call the speed of trust. Speed of trust is content around building trust and culture so that as they go forward with technology, trust becomes sort of the glue that holds the teams together. Helps them, you know, and we talk about an economic model of trust, right? When trust is high, speed is fast, costs are low. And when trust is low, speed is slow, and costs are high. And so we look at trust from an economic perspective, and then we look at what are the behaviors and the conversations people need to have in order to build trust. And so as we work with different clients throughout the world, this was kind of a fun engagement. I was, was hired on by Arthur Blank, who's the owner of the Atlanta Falcons. Do we have any football fans in here? And so picture this. I go in, Arthur Blank, billionaire, buys the Atlanta Falcons, signs it on a napkin. Buy, I think he pays like four or five hundred million for it, just cash, you know. Not too bad. And then he said, look, I, I want you to come in and I want you to be the executive coach to our coach, Mike Smith, and Thomas Dimitrov, who's the GM. Thomas came from New England Patriots. Mike Smith's a new coach. And uh, we want you to come in and work with him on some leadership and, and coaching issues. So I find myself meeting with this NFL coach and this great GM one-on-one. -on -one, and then we get done with the session. He goes, do you have any kids? I said, yes, I've got four boys. He said, well, why don't you bring them on out to an Atlanta Falcons football game? We'll put you up in a box. We'll take care of food. And you want to go to the aquarium and you want to come out and come on out. And I'm like, I feel like I've died and gone to heaven. I thought, how great is this? My wife is here. And so <coughs> we took the boys and went out to Atlanta Falcons football game. And they kind of rolled out the red carpet. And I thought, you know, this consulting works really kind of fun. This is really kind of good stuff. So anyway, a lot of great clients and a lot of great stories. What well, I won't bore you with anymore, but the, we work with a lot of the top tier organizations globally. We also leverage a lot of the content from some of the world's greatest leaders. So it's not just Stephen Covey-centric, which we leverage, obviously, the seven habits of highly effective people and the eighth habit. He didn't get the seven habits right, so he had to create an extra habit. But uh, great content from Dr. Covey. But we use some of Jack Welch's from GE on winning with talent management, some of Stephen M. R. Covey's on speed of trust. Um, I use some of Gert Hofstede's. This is a book that I wrote with um, Roger Merrill, Todd Davis, and Sean Moon called Talent Unleashed. And then this is another book I wrote on coaching called Unlocking Potential. And I use a lot of that in coaching. Um, we also use some of Clayton Christensen's content from The Innovator's Dilemma, Fred Reichelt on customer satisfaction, and then some of Ram Sharan's work on getting people to think like CEOs and helping teams execute. So we have some of the world-class world content, and that's why organizations hire us. They say, teach us and help us understand some of these leadership principles 
and help us sort of be better and do better. So we leverage some of this content. Now, what do we do? We <coughs> obviously are into building great leaders, teams, and culture. So when I was with GenPAC this week in New York City at the Marriott Marquis for three days, we had a group of maybe 25 leaders that came in and we had, it's kind of like a mini MBA. We had kind of a workout around how they can inspire trust with key stakeholders, how they can clarify vision and purpose with their teams, how they can execute better with their teams, set goals and execute, and how they can unleash their talent. And so I, we did the four imperatives of great leaders. When I was at GE the week before, we did this leading at the speed of trust. It was a, we have a two-day workout, a one-day workout. I was there just for an afternoon to give them some of the concepts and ideas that they could use to better impact trust within their teams and their culture. And then we also work with developing highly effective leaders with the seven habits. We have a three-day workout, two-day workout. I worked with two government organizations this summer. Um, my family and I, we, we moved to Malaysia. Uh, so I've been going to Malaysia for the last 10 years. And a few years back, they said, would you mind coming and working more full-time? They wanted me to come on a long-term arrangement for a year or two years. And I said, how about two months? Because we've our kids, we've got two kids at Timview and we've got two kids at Ivy Hall Academy. We've sort of moved back to Utah and we've got a lot of great family resources here. And so we said, how about if we just take a couple months and go over and we help drive business? And it was interesting, we had the largest utility company, which is government owned, called Tanaga National Bearhard. And I had the opportunity to teach seven habits to the CEO and their leadership team and their next level of leaders and they were taking seven habits to about 7,000 people. Now, their other facilitators will teach as they go down in the organization, we'll certify them, but with the CEO on the top, I was able to work with uh, uh, an individual who was um, Dr. Siri Osman, who was um, appointed by the Prime Minister of Malaysia. It was kind of cool. And then I actually had a chance <clears throat> to work with a Malaysia rubber board, another government organization, um, Dr. Samilia, and she's appointed by the Prime Minister as well. And we've had a chance to do seven habits, speed of trust, and then we, just, we did some uh, four disciplines of execution, some of our goal clarity work. So it's interesting how you know, we work with corporate, with government, with education, but many of you that may be going the government route, um, my advice to you would be to get as much business experience as you can. If you're going foreign service, you're going federal government, state government, local government, um, or if you go, say, FBI, CIA, DEA, get as much business experience as you can. Now, I know many of you are on a pure business path, but for those of you that are sort of considering that, um, I would also recommend project management experience. Um, many, it doesn't matter whether you're in corporate or government. Many of you are going to be leading large engagements. But I've, got a, I've got a cousin who was, um, he's a BYU grad, his name's Dr. Skip Bailey, and, and Skip was the director of the FBI, their IT department, left there, he, went, he's now, he was the CIO of Homeland Security of their IT department, it was tobacco, alcohol, and firearms, and he had about a $500 million budget, and then he was recruited away by Deloitte Consulting. So you go to Georgetown, you go right across the river, you see Deloitte Consulting, and now he's consulting to governments. Where did he start his, his uh, career? Church headquarters, LDS Church. So he was the LDS Church. He was there for his entire career working in the genealogy department, working in IT. Then he went out to government. After the Olympics, a lot of the security that came here from the government of the United States came, and they said, gosh, these BYU grads are pretty good. They picked a couple BYU grads out of IT from the church, put them in these government organizations, and he's had a pretty nice career since then. So <coughs> let, me, um, let me talk about how we work with clients real quickly, and then we'll get into some more practical things for you as students in your career. When we work with corporations, a lot of times we'll do what's called an assessment, and we'll, we'll get, you know, so it's called a leadership quotient, and an individual will send it out to his or her boss, peers, direct reports, subordinates, and they get feedback, 360-degree feedback on their leadership style. So they come to a classroom like this week and they sit down and they get this data. Here's your strengths and here's your weaknesses. 
And then there's comments, and it's all anonymous. And then they go through a three-day leadership workshop, and they get a contract, a tool, and so a set of CDs with some tools and so forth. And they get a chance to really look at their leadership strengths and capabilities. And why do I say that to you as students? Because it's important for you to understand what you're really, really good at. What do you love? What are you passionate about? What excites you? Where are your natural gifts? Where are your natural talents? Because I'm a firm believer that if you pursue what you love, that wonderful opportunities will open themselves up. There's a lot of theory and a lot of thought out there that you should just look at leadership gaps from a weakness perspective and try and close your gaps. And that's important for you to work on closing your gaps. But more importantly than that is for you to focus on your strengths. Play to your strengths. Play to your gifts. What do you love to do? What excites you? And I promise you, that's, your career will be a lot more happier if you're playing to your natural gifts and talents rather than trying to force fit something into something you don't like, you're not good at, and you're not passionate about. Okay? We'll talk more about that. So in these leadership courses, we have, they walk away with a leadership game plan. These folks in this, this Indian company I was working with this week, I put all of them into coaching relationships, and, and they've got a six-month workout. They meet once a month for six months, and then they report out to their boss on results at three months and at six months, and then they take another assessment, and they see how perceptions have changed of them in the workplace. What's interesting about success with leadership is this. Two-thirds of your success as leaders will not be your IQ, your, you know, your, your functional brilliance, your technical brilliance. Two-thirds of your success as a leader as you go up will be EQ, your emotional intelligence. Uh, Daniel Goleman, G-O-L-E-M-A-N, has a lot of great research from Rutgers University. It's called emotional intelligence. And as you look at that, your success will be based on your communication, your listening, your connecting, self-regulation of your emotions with temper and anger and frustration and so forth. How do you self-regulate? And how do you show up as a leader when you're with other, other people? It really starts as roommates, it starts as mission companions, and it goes off into your career. It's in the household. My wife could probably share with you my, uh, plenty of my weaknesses from an EQ perspective, but it's really a lifelong journey, but your success will be based on two-thirds of your success as you go up in an organization will be EQ, not IQ. And so what we try and do with our courses is we really try and get leaders to think, how can you show up better as a leader? How can you better influence your team, both in terms of how you're showing up from a trustworthy perspective, what kinds of conversations are you holding, how are you setting vision and mission and values and purpose, direction and goals, how are you engaging people, or do I come out, do I tell people what to do, do I tell people how to do it, am I dictatorial? Not real high EQ. And so there's a number of models we use. I won't um, go off into any much more detail, but that's kind of the process of what we do with leaders to help them become better. <coughs> now, my career path, what kind of got me to, to get into leadership development and into consulting? I want to just share about six what I call key leverage points of things that, that kind of along the path, as I was reflecting coming back from New York last night, I kind of had my laptop out and I was thinking, if I'm a student at BYU, and as I reflect back many years ago, I graduated in 1990, here 86 through 90, but as I reflect back, what were some of these key leverage points? What were some of the key triggers that really amplified or accelerated my path? And as I look back, the first thing was uh, being a, a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, period. The best experience of my entire life. Matter of fact, there's a young woman here who I was companions with her father, um, Elder Keddington, in Iowa, and um, one of just absolutely one of the greatest guys on the planet, one of my a really really dear friend. Um, uh, but I, I had probably one of most, my most profound experiences, and I, I reflected on what was it: work ethic, <clears throat> missions sound great, it's just a lot of hard work, day in and day out. And there's a law of the harvest and a work ethic that happens. And um, certainly that's, and, and I think the core values and beliefs. I think you go out, you may be completely all in and convicted to have a great testimony. You may not. 
But when you get out there, you really have to ask yourself, what do I believe and why do I believe it? And am I willing to spend my full time 24 seven doing this? And it really helps clarify your values and beliefs. What's important? I think overcoming challenges. Much of leadership talks about successes and best practices, but how do you learn from failure? How do you learn from losses? How do you learn from setbacks and challenges and barriers when life doesn't go so easy? Because we know, you know, life is about practical problem solving. Life's about overcoming challenges. And we have these sort of moments in these peaks where you baptize someone and life is all great. And then it's back to people are telling you you're going to, <clears throat> you know what? People don't like you. People slam the door in your face. And there's a lot of challenge. You look over and you're like, I kind of got this companion and maybe we're really not gelling too well. You know, there's lots of things that show up. And I think one great thing about a mission was it just teaches you to kind of overcome stuff, gets you centered. And then I think you become a, a leader because you're, you're training companions, you're training districts, you're training zones, you're, you're, tr you're looking at conferences and giving speeches and all that kind of stuff. And that really, that was a solidifying leverage point. The other one is the BYU Kennedy Center. <coughs> Um, I signed up for study abroad, and I didn't know it was going to be so profound, but it was probably one of the most profound experiences of my entire academic experience. Um, I didn't tell my friends I was going because I didn't want this to be sort of Provo, Utah, college buddies in Europe. So I was stealth. I didn't say one word to my buddies. And I went to my dad. My dad told me when I got off my mission, he said, um, we've paid for your schooling. We've paid for all this. You had a scholarship your freshman year. We'll pay for your mission. When you come from your mission, we're going to cut you off financially. I laughed. I thought he was joking. He wasn't joking. <laughs> so at 21, I found myself working. I was working at Nordstrom, and I, you know, I was kind of <coughs> doing some retail, and, and I was doing some different odd jobs here and there for school, putting myself through school. And I told him, I said, I want to go study abroad to London. Doesn't that sound great? My dad goes, I've never been to London. I would like to go to London. How much is it? I go, it's about $6,000. He goes, I'll tell you what, I'll kick in $1,000. i am like, what? 1000 OK. So guess what I did? Had to work weekends and evenings and holidays. And, and just I kind of cranked up the work while I was going to school, and I made the money. Went to, went to London, England, and it was transformational. My, my view of the world went like this. And I came back, and I said, I've got to be an IR major. There's actually a major where you get to study international relations, different politics, different economies. This is awesome. So I changed my major. And that was a major, major touch point. The other was after I graduated, um, when I was leaving Franklin Covey, or Covey Leadership Center at the time, I'd worked with them for about eight years. And I, I worked with them through school. Right when I got back from study abroad, I got on at, at Covey Leadership Center. Worked, worked with them, took a year off school. My parents had moved to San Diego. I worked full time for Covey Leadership Center. I was putting myself through school. Came back to BYU, was working away, graduated. And then in about 1995, I said, I need to do something different in my career. What got me here won't get me there. And I was looking at the senior consultants, different people, and I said, you know what? Those people that are senior consultants doing really interesting work, they've ran a business, they've got outside experience, they have graduate degrees and international experience. And I'm like, I'm going to have to leave Covey for a while. So I left Covey. So within a period of about two months, I sold my condo, sold my car, got engaged, accepted to teach in China at a university, and accepted grad school in Columbia. And literally, I had all these major changes in about two months. But I had a clear vision of exactly where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. And I'd been saving money for a few years. And so <coughs> I went, came back here to the Kennedy Center, and they had this China teachers program. They were sending about 65 professors to different universities all throughout China. And everything I was reading, I literally was, I was at Packard Electric getting ready to do a leadership workshop for a senior team. And I, I literally woke up in the middle of the night and I said, everything I've been reading, I'm like, I've got to get to China. 1995, I've got to get to China. And I didn't know how I was going to get there. And so I called Jeff Ringer and I said, Jeff, I have a friend that went through your China teacher's program a year ago. Can we talk? Jeff's like, absolutely. So I went and met with Jeff, and he's like, done. Let's get you to China. 
So we, um, he said, we got an opening in Guangzhou at South China University of Technology. So I applied, got accepted, got my acceptance back from Columbia. And literally, um, within a few weeks after that, I was in China. My wife was finishing her degree in Russian. She went on a mission to Moscow. And so she went over to the University of Moscow, and she's playing volleyball here at BYU. And um, she, she was coaching with Elaine Michaelis her last year and ended up kind of getting all the wedding plans and everything ready. While I was in China, she was here finishing her last semester. So she went to Russia, studied at the University of Moscow, came home, finished up with BYU. I came back between uh, semesters of teaching. We got married, and literally, like two weeks later, we were in San Diego, and then we were, we were in Guangzhou, China, and I had set up a teaching position for her. Now, what was interesting about this teaching position is I taught at a sister university and Cynthia taught at another university, so she'd take a bus over to this sister university. And I would teach there once a week. I, I, I would go over and teach an evening class. And we would go for date night out to McDonald's. So we'd go, you know, big spender in China, right? So we'd go to McDonald's, and then we'd go to class, and she had about 30 people in her class at this university. Well, I would show up. I was just down the hall from her class, and I'd show up and watch her class, and literally I'd walk in, and she'd have about 70 Chinese kids packed into her class. And I'm like, you only got 30 on your roster. And uh, it was like, well, yeah, she's blonde. She's 5'10". She's beautiful. I got it. <laughs> okay, 30 students into 70 students. I got it. <laughs> so it was kind of fun. I would show up, and all these kids would be in there taking notes and listening to her, and they're not even in her class. I'd go into my class, and there'd be like five people, you know, taking notes. But, um, China Teachers Program, international experience, phenomenal. I also worked as an external consultant for Nike doing seven habits training for about a year and, and some coaching and doing some cross-cultural work. I brought in some Gert Hofstede, for those of you that have done some work with Hofstede, um, on cross-cultural um, behavior. Cubby Leadership Center, I've talked about that. I worked part-time while I was in school. I got out, and I had a job. Um, I think I was making maybe 50000 when I got out. But what was interesting is a lot of my friends that didn't work through college, which is fine, but when I got out, I had a really good job. It was with a great company. And what was interesting is the potential went just like this. I mean, I, the sky was the limit. And I had many of my colleagues saying, hey, how'd you get in at Covey? It's like, well, I worked part-time, and I took a year off school and worked in San Diego. You know, it was, you know... It wasn't easy, but my point is this. If you have the opportunity to work for internships, research, to get experience, figure out ways to get experience on your resume, okay? <clears throat> and that was a huge touch point. And then after China, I went to Columbia. While I was at Columbia, I was studying organizational behavior, but they also had a degree, it was called Conflict Resolution and Mediation through the ICCC arts, the International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution. Now what was interesting about that is had I not been here at BYU in, in IR, there's no way I would have gotten a graduate study certificate in Conflict Resolution and Mediation. But I was like, hey, we studied some of this at BYU. I like, you know, this whole thing about conflict resolution, mediation. So as part of my program, I did an internship at the United Nations. We would go in and teach professional and general services staff on conflict resolution, conflict resolution, mediation, diversity, a lot of these key issues, and just plugged right into that system. And I ended up getting a certificate. Well, guess what happens in consulting? There's a lot of fighting, a lot of tension, a lot of silos, a lot of issues. Guess what skills you use? Move off positional clashes, reframe needs. Don't look at either or thinking, but and thinking. How can you get this while you get this? How do you reframe needs? How do you look for third alternatives? All of these great skills in consulting, there's no way I would have done it had I not had that touch point of the Kennedy Center. And so, again, kind of interesting. Then I, I got on, there's about 250 people out for an internship with Ernst & Young in their change management practice, and I was fortunate to be one of the two people to get that. And guess what? My experience in China, my experience at Covey, my experience at the United Nations, it didn't just happen by chance. I had to look for certain things that, to differentiate myself from my colleagues. And those things that I had done at BYU, in the Kennedy Center, in London, in China, the resources that are here 
opened up this door where I was one of 250 people. And there were actually two people that got the, Vreni Homas, a friend of mine from Denmark, she had banking industry experience. So she was in New York. They set me up with an apartment in Georgetown. And I, they would fly me back and forth every week. They even let me, in my internship, go back to New York, Columbia, and finish some of my coursework so I could get my graduate study certificate. So they paid me $35,000 for a summer, which paid for one year of schooling. And it was because of my experience here at BYU, what the Kennedy Center offered me. And again, another key touch point that really helped me. Now, when I graduated, I didn't go to ENY. I, I kind of switched and decided to go to PricewaterhouseCoopers. And we had about 70% of our consultants in my practice, there were about 40 of us, that were all in the Columbia program, PhD, MOB, or MBA program. And our, our practice was called Strategic and Organizational Change. So guess what happened? One more touch point, getting experience at ENY, PwC comes along, and guess what they do? They have a sign-on bonus that pays for my college. Literally, a sign-on bonus that pays for my college. And you're paying about 45000 a year for an Ivy League uh, education. And so I happen to be you know, kind of lucky and fall into this situation because of some of my experiences here. And then management consulting, we're working with state, local, gov federal government, and corporate clients. So again, if, you, if you're from, coming from a government perspective, consulting is a really good path for you to get training, to get a logo on your resume, to get experience with project management, and to work with both either corporations or they have government practices. I worked on a couple government engagements, up in one in Albany, New York, with the work, New York State Workers' Compensation Board. And it was a phenomenal experience. My, my partner on that project, he was a, a um, captain in the, uh, in the Navy. So he had left the military, came over, was at PwC, and he was my partner. But anyway, again, from a government perspective, for those of you that are in government, consulting is a really nice way to go. And then Franklin C Covey. Um, over the last 10 years, I've had a chance to, to work in North, all throughout North America, Europe, Russia, Asia, Mexico, Latin America. I'll be in Brazil and Argentina at the end of this month. The last two months, um, I've been in Singapore. Um, I had a project in Iceland with a bank, uh, Landsbanken. And then I was in Denmark with Pandora. They do the, the little charm bracelets. I um, was with them uh, within the last two months. And then I um, was in Canada. And so obviously you have a lot of opportunity to travel and, and see the world and work in, with great international organizations. Um, we've been living the last three summers in Kuala Lumpur. So we take our kids over and we have a great opportunity to get them exposed to the Muslim and the Hindu and the Buddhist Chinese culture. We also have a nice uh, Mormon branch right in KL. Um, and so our kids get a chance to, we've baptized um, our one boy there, uh, this, what, couple of years ago, and then we uh, gave the priesthood to our 12-year-old our this last year. So we, just for two months, we have our records transferred over, and it, it turns out to be a wonderful experience. <coughs> Singapore, um, same thing. We'll be there this summer focusing on China, uh, kind of help, helping to grow the business there. I've already quoted this, but this idea that the new global currency, okay, it's to create jobs. So for you, as, as sitting in, in your chairs thinking about what's my role as a student, what got you here won't get you there. <laughs> so what do you need to focus on? And this is kind of where I started. Leaders, and I would say students, must develop a systematic process to help people find out and clarify what their strengths are and how to capitalize that on them. Now obviously as you look in, in business, it's about managing yourself. You want to get skills in managing others sometimes managing managers or departments or functions, or even managing a business. This is uh, Ram Sharam's leadership pipeline. But as you look at your career, you're going to want to get skills as you go up. In you know, time management is a big idea. Project management is a big idea. Managing and leading other people. Managing a budget, a p and uh, My cousin Skip Bailey managed, managed probably close to a half a billion dollar budget when he was at Alcohol Tobacco and Firearm with with Homeland Security. So whether you're government or whether you're business, you have to know the economics and the numbers. And you want to get experience doing that. So <coughs> um, 
real quickly, I've hired a couple interns. Luke Ball was an intern. He was in my presentation a couple years ago here. Came up to me, gave me his card, and said, hey, I really would like to do an internship with Franklin Covey. Guess what we did? I put him on a project, and he helped me do the research on these four books with Dr. David Paxman. Dr. David Paxman was a retired English professor, and he was my counselor when I was a bishop here on campus. And we kind of got together and we did research for about two years on the world's greatest leadership quote books, individual, team, organization, and society. And Luke Ball, who was in this class, was someone I hired to help me on that research project. Um, what was Luke's? He was an undergraduate. He developed great project management skills, research skills. He was very passionate. And every time we got together, we'd meet over at uh, J Dogs and get a a dog or we'd go over to Panda Express and get some Chinese food and talk about the project. He was always asking, hey, I've got my resume. Could you look at my resume? Hey, I've got these things I'm thinking about. And we were just networking and I was opening up my Rolodex and trying to provide him with contacts. And uh, anyway, it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. Reese Hayden, Taylor Everett, they're working with me right now. They have good technology skills and they're working with me on some uh, participant materials and on some marketing materials and some content. And same thing. When we get together, they're always asking me tough questions. Um, Justin Kellop, who's here. Justin, why don't you just take a second and kind of share your experience with a couple of the interns you've hired. Why is it that you've hired them, and what value have they added to you at uh, Franklin Covey? Yeah, thanks. Logan's here. He does a great job because he has this attitude and disposition of, I want to get in and I want to get it done. Right? I, I'm willing to jump in. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I have to learn how to use software packets to help do some dashboarding for some of our data that we have. So it's just a great opportunity to come in. Uh, he was just out with us in Orlando. In Orlando, we had an international conference where we had over 150 of our, our business partners in Orlando representing 150 different countries. And so he got to meet folks from literally all over the world, from Dubai, from uh, Thailand, from Indonesia, and so forth. And just a great opportunity to learn how to write reports, how to do analysis and research, and an opportunity to meet uh, folks internationally and build this network. Yeah. Is that good enough? That's perfect. Let me just close with this slide, and then I want to give a quote. What are some personal lessons and some professional lessons of what I've learned, and maybe some things to pass on to you? Number one, keep family first. Um, and I put there, counsel, get buy-in with spouse. Um, we've lived in China. Um, I've lived in you know, UK. My wife's lived in Russia. We've lived in Malaysia. We're going to be living in Singapore. You have to, if you're going into international relations, your spouse has to be all in. And if he or she is not, you need to have that conversation. I have never once felt any pressure about, you know, it's basically my wife's like, hey, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Singapore, let's go. Malaysia, let's go. But if your spouse isn't, you've got to have those conversations if you want to go international. Um, fast pray counsel with the Lord. Study your patriarchal blessing. Play to your natural gifts and strengths and talents. When you're in these areas of the world, be active in your church and community service. Be ethical. Don't do anything that would be contrary to your values. Be disciplined, set goals, have a game plan. Be hardworking, sacrifice. Do those things that other people are not willing to do. No attitude of entitlement. No one is going to give you anything. You've got to work and scrap and fight for everything you get. But don't be entitled, whatever you do. Be willing to do, like, like Justin said, even the littlest of things. Okay, on the professional side, love what you're doing. Find out what your passion is. Find out what your unique voice and contribution is. Enjoy not only the outcome, but enjoy the process. Right now, enjoy the process. I know it's easy to say, but difficult to do, but enjoy the process. Design, create your future. Use your RNI. That means resources and initiative. Use your resources and initiative. Aim as high as you can. Shoot for the moon. Go big. I say go big or go home. <laughs> Just, you know, go for the greatest, the best programs. Go for the best jobs. Go, go high, go big. Don't be held back by anything that's conventional or people telling you you can't do it. Build your resume. Get your network. Get good mentors. Get as much education as you can. Got an undergraduate, get a master's. Got a master's, get a PhD. Whatever your life can, can, uh, can handle in terms of what you're doing, get as much education as you can. Get as much practical business experience. Intern. 
they say that every big name you have on your resume, if you get PwC or Ernst & Young or GE or Frito-Lay or Coca-Cola, get big names early on. Each, each logo is worth $45,000. You come, even, I'm, I'm telling you, even if you're making copies, you want to get in with the big name companies and build your brand early on. They train you, they develop you, they mentor you. Get big names and big brands on your, your resume early on. Uh, get functional technical project management experience. Get global mindset. I say get out of Utah. Now I say that I'm a Utah and I love Utah. We moved back to Utah. We're raising our family here. Get the heck out of Utah. Don't be just consumed with a nice warm blankie of the Wasatch Mountain Range and family dinners. Be prepared to go out and explore the world. Cut the apron strings and go have fun. And then come back, come back later. But, and I say it with all due respect, I love Utah. Utah's a great quality of life, but get out and go explore the world. The world needs you. Building the church, um, getting these great experiences. Okay, um, this is my family. And I, as I said, put your family first. The reason why we do uh, Singapore and Malaysia in the summer is because I'm gone 200 days a year, and that's way too much. I'm gone a lot. And so it's our reprieve where we can go, we can swim, we can play tennis, we go to church, we walk to the movie theater, we hang out, and put your, make sure you keep your family at the forefront. I'm so grateful for my family and their support for me on this journey that we're on. And um, I, I want to, if anyone wants to keep in contact my email is Michael Simpson at FranklinCovey.com, or you can get me at Simpson Executive Coaching or at Franklin Covey. Justin Callop's got cards as well. If you're interested in an internship at Franklin Covey, see Justin. He'll take good care of you, and he's putting together a big list and going to be interviewing people. Um, greatness is not a function of the environment, condition, or circumstance. It's a matter of choice. Play to your strengths. Look for the good wherever you go. That's from a taxi cab driver from Bangladesh. And then the last one, let me just close with this. Alma 26, we've been made instruments in the hands of God to bring about this great work. They are in the hands of the Lord of the harvest, and they are his, and he will raise them up. Blessed be the name of our God. I do not boast in my own strength nor in my own wisdom. Yea, I know I'm nothing. As to my strengths, I am weak. Therefore, I will not boast of myself, but I will boast of my God. For in my, his strength, I can do all things, yea, many mighty miracles. And I just want to close with that, that BYU students can differentiate themselves from anyone on the planet. And you know what you're about from the mission of enter to learn and go forth to serve. And partner with the Lord, and as you partner in covenant with him, he will make more out of your career than ever, you ever could be alone or trying to do this thing without his help. Lean on him in all things, and I promise you, he will raise you up, and he will open up doors far greater than what you've ever even imagined. I know this to be the case because it's happened in my life, and I've seen his hand <laughs> again and again and again. And I know for each one of you, he knows you by name. He knows you by name. And you have a great, fun, exciting work to do. Just make sure you partner with him and you realize where your strength comes from. And uh, again, thank you very much for letting me be a part of this session. And uh, I guess we'll bring it to a close. Thank you.